Uh, welcome. Um, this is the Decentralization and Local Governance in Fragile Contexts uh, talk. Um, and I'll speak for about 20 minutes with um, a main focus on the overview of some big picture ideas that I think are very important for this topic. And then I'll go into some advantages and disadvantages, which I think to some extent the audience knows, but I might have a little bit different take on it. Um, then I'll have some conclusions, some synthesis of this material, and I'll end up with the role for non-state actors in these contexts, which is more thoughts than a comprehensive um, approach. So without further ado, let's talk about some big ideas um, and how this space is changing. So let's, let's first start with um, how I think of fragility. I think mostly um, a lot of donors, a lot of actors in this space, they tend to start with the state society relationship they tend to think about um, social contract and the state, and they focus a lot of their effort on making the state work better or more accountable to society. I don't think about uh, the fragility in this way whatsoever. I think of fragility as being the product of two, um, two, two types of challenges that states have, and when they're in together, a country is likely to be very fragile. The first area is the social fragmentation. Countries that are highly cohesive may have development challenges, but they tend not to be fragile. And the second area I look at is the level of institutionalization. This is not just institutions, it's the level of institutionalization, which looks at the ability of institutions, particularly the government, but not only organizations, and NGOs, companies, any institution to be able to work autonomously, um, impersonally, um, across distance, um, equitably for many actors. So when you're in a country that has high levels of social fragmentation, uh, maybe there's um, uh, ethnic, religious, clan, regional, uh, whatever the fragmentation, and you have institutions that are incapable of managing conflict between groups, that combination creates what I would call a structurally fragile country. Uh, you can have cohesion and, and somehow a cohesive group of people, they figure problems out among themselves. If you have pretty good institutions that work independently of the actor, you can manage conflict and things work well. For example, we're in Belgium uh, right now. Belgium has a country that is has a certain degree of social fragmentation, but the institutions work. The rules of the game are widely accepted, and the social conflict is managed. If you're in Somalia, you have greater fragmentation, of course, but you have no mechanism to bring the groups together across clans. So that combination for me is fragility. And that will be important for what I say next. Now, um, I would say in the fragile state space right now, the big change from for me is the change in the balance of power between state and non-state actors. What was possible for states to do 20, 30 years ago, they cannot do today. And there's, uh, broadly speaking, four changes that have taken place. Um, uh, first change is in terms of technology, uh, changes in technology that has led to changes in communication. Uh, individuals, groups, actors, non-state actors have much, much greater capacity, whether it's because of tele uh, cell phones, internet, social media, to communicate and therefore organize. That is a huge difference from 15 or 20 years ago. Uh, second thing, idea ideas have changed. That's to some degree international ideologies or simply the fact that people are much more aware of what is happening in different parts of the world and expectations have changed or to some extent globalization has impacted identity. So identities have changed. 
The key point is ideas have changed and a lot of the influence that has led to those changes because of transnational factors. The third thing I would say is this a proliferation of weapons, uh, partly because technologies allowed groups to uh, make weapons they could not make before, but also there's so many more weapons. Non-state actors have much more powerful weapons than they ever had before. And the fourth big change for me is the international community is much more fragmented. It was fragmented in the Cold War. Then we had a, a relative uh, cohesion for 15 or so years, 20 years. And in the recent years, we have more fragmentation. And because the world has become much more multipolar, you have conflicts um, or actually you have cases, even when there's no conflict with different international actors are supporting different parts of a society, Lebanon. Lebanon has um, different actors in Lebanon being supported by different international partners. So these four elements mean that states are less cohesive, national political settlements are harder to reach, uh, fragmentation is greater uh, or, ex or exasperated, and the state is unable to, to control uh, the, the territory or to consolidate power in the same way it could previously. What Syria could do in 1982, when it crushed the rebellion in uh, Hama, uh, it could not do in 2011. The dynamics had changed, the balance of power had changed. So, with that as a background, I just want to make a couple of brief points, and then I'm going to run through the advantages and disadvantages. Transitions are much harder today than they were before because of these because of the change of balance of power, but also because um, countries that transitioned uh, in the 90s, Eastern Europe, before that in Latin America, the 80s, 70s, and Southern Europe, these were consolidated countries. Many of the countries that transition now in the Middle East and Africa, Arab Spring countries or places becoming democratic in Africa, they are fragile. Go back to my fragmentation, institutionalization. The Middle East and Africa are where most of the world's fragile states are. About three quarters of them are in this territory. Yes, you have Nepal. Yes, you have Myanmar. Yes, you have Guatemala and so on and so forth. But three quarters plus is in these, in these regions because the countries are fragmented. The institutions don't work in, uh, as autonomous units uh, with some exceptions, of course. So you have all this problem. Transitions are much more likely to go astray. Um, and when we're looking at fragile contexts, especially in transitions, but in general, we're looking at countries that are much more likely to be unconsolidated versus consolidated. Go back to my, my starting point. The unconsolidated countries have much greater need for creative governance patterns or strategies because of their fragmentation institutions problem, which is why we're talking about decentralization. It's very important. The more consolidated countries don't have these problems. Tunisia is not a fragile state. It was not a fragile state in 2011-12. It is not one now. Yes, it has development problems, corruption problems, economic problems. It is not fragile. It is not fragmented and doesn't have the institutional challenges that these other cases have. Um, I would not call Egypt um, highly, fr highly fragile either, except maybe the Sinai, a fragile region, because these problems are not to the same degree as Libya, Yemen, uh, Sahel, Central Africa. So just keeping that thought in mind. And the last point I want to make is when we talk about institution building, we're not always talking of state building. It's very important. Most, and this is important for when we talk about local governance and decentralization. S mostly international actors go into countries and they try to build states. And uh, they focus on the central government. It's the default uh, strategy. Even when they decentralize, they tend to focus on formal. When I talk about institution building, I'm talking about tend to be a much broader set of possible institutions that I would consider acceptable. Uh, you can work when you do local government or decentralization, you could be working with um, local communities. You could be working with some sort of traditional institutions. You could sometimes have to work with religious actors. Um, and decentralization, 
to the extent that it thinks more broadly and it allows you to think more broadly about what institutions are, I think it is better able to empower local people to manage their affairs. I'm thinking Libya is really a country I work on a lot right now. Libya, I do not see how you do a top-down centralized political settlement, highly fragmented. The institutions that work are local. Why not build governance around institutions that work and have a much thinner layer at the top? Anyone that wants to talk about Libya, feel free to contact me. So Libya is a really good example of what I mean by institution building from what works, not state building from what we want to work and may not fit context. So let's go. Um, uh, let me go. That was, let me just go briefly um, through advantages and disadvantages. I think again, the audience mostly knows this, so I do not want to uh, dwell on it in great detail. Um, but uh, again, my take might be different. Advantages. So I'm going to give you a few advantages. First of all, it's a highly rated mechanism decentralization, as I just mentioned, to manage conflict when you have different groups and they do not do well uh, working together. There's not mechanisms to help them work together, and there's lots of arguments about distribution of power and resources. To the extent that you let the Kurds in Kurdistan manage their own affairs, they're going to be happy, and you're more likely to get institutions that work because it's building on something that uh, fits context well. As Somalia, you're more likely to have a decentralization that will work um, given the context, but we can think of this uh, uh, around many urban areas in, um, in Africa. I can think of an urban-based governance model that works around cities, much more likely. Lagos is much more likely to work than Nigeria. There's more cohesion. There's less social fragmentation. Institutions work better. There's no need to deal with the problem of distance. So anyway, the point of all these examples is it's a highly weighted tool to manage conflict. There tends to be greater legitimacy of the state when local people can manage their own institutions. Fewer grievances, less polarization. There's more scope to manage or leverage social cohesion. Never forget that institutions work best when they build on social cohesion. Very hard to build strong institutions in highly fragmented contexts. The groups are fighting each other trying to grab the most they can from institutions, hard to build institutions, especially from the outside in. I think we see that in many, many of these cases. Uh, we're not going to build strong central government institutions in Afghanistan with this dynamic, and so on and so forth. Um, more scope to leverage institutions, and I've discussed more that we need to think broadly about institutions. Work with the grain. Build on what works. Even in failed states or highly fragile states, there's a lot of institutions that work. People just don't live as individuals. They live in communities. They need institutions. They have some. Some are brought from the past. Some are hybrid. Some are formed on the fly. Whatever it may be, to the extent that we can leverage things that are working, I think always it's very hard to bring those to scale, but to the extent that we can work with them, strengthen them, and incrementally grow up instead of trying to create something up here that's going to go down, I think uh, there's a lot of advantages to this approach. You need to balance it, as I'll discuss in my conclusions. Also, formal institutions. If we're trying to build formal governance institutions, when you're local, Urban, really good example given the, the large uh, urbanization going on right now in the world. But to the extent that you can have institutions formal that go across distance, I think much more likely if, the, if formal institutions are spread over territory and not just trying to project from the center. And I would say lastly, greater scope for accountability of leaders. In these cases, very hard for people all across the DRC to organize themselves and hold their leaders accountable. Not that it might work everywhere, but I can imagine in provinces of the DRC, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and some of the major urban areas, I can see good examples of things like Lagos being reproduced in these places. I think, for example, in Africa, I think there's lots of cities where you could certainly build around and to accept the country can have 
multiple, a little bit more balanced development, multiple successful cities that will work to make the national uh, government uh, and the national politics work more constructively over time. Those are advantages. Let me go to disadvantages. Same problems that exist nationally may exist locally. Fragmentation, state capture, corruption. Local uh, governance, uh, local governments or local institutions with weak economy, no revenue source can be a problem for sure. Um, potential for regional imbalances. Some areas have natural wealth, some don't. You got to think what is the formula to compensate for this? You want to you want to give locals p some power over the natural resources and their strong economy, but you got to find ways to uh, redistribute to some extent. Don't give them 100%. Maybe they get 25% and 75% is distributed elsewhere, whatever it might be for natural resources. If you're trying to strengthen institutions, you certainly have a lot more places to strengthen institutions. Uh, there's always the potential for successionism, but if, again, if we have minimum uh, lines, we have lines, uh, red lines where we don't accept accept successionism, like in Iraq, we've seen that. Um, it, the, the, the regions can't go that way. And of course, you might have some concerns over human rights and uh, and very decentralized uh, arrangements with non traditional with non uh, formal actors, um, and I'll discuss a little bit that last point in my uh, in my last section on non state actors. So let me move to conclusions here. I want to go to the last two sections quickly. So um, I think if you've listened to everything I've said, I'm going to run off uh, about seven conclusions, and they should be relatively clear. Um, and I think um, everybody should know um, many of these already. First, understanding context, extremely important. We definitely need to move away from templates. Um, we say this all the time. We have a very hard time doing it. Uh, we tend to go in with the same uh, play, plan, plan of action. Um, we do not start from the problem. We do not start from the context and work backwards. We tend to start from we need to have these things with a checklist and try to work forward. I do not think this works. I think it's been discredited, yet we have a very hard time changing that dynamic. Point two, decentralization can surely help. It's an essential part of addressing fragility. However, given different contexts, different institutions, different types of fragmentation, the formula for what it, decentralization might look like, the mixed local central in terms of what is going where and how is in terms of uh, taxation rights, the responsibilities and so on and so forth can vary tremendously across countries and may even have to vary across countries. Think Indonesia, special decentralization for Aceh to uh, address the problems in Aceh. Um, after the tsunami, that led to a peace agreement and the decades of conflict. But the rest of Indonesia, it does decentralize, but it does not decentralize to the same extent. So a good example of how different regions could have different formulas. Um, decentralization is most likely going to work point three, where local groups are cohesive. cohesive. Remember, I always believe cohesion is a prerequisite for institution building, which is a prerequisite for peace, development, governance. When you have high fragmentations, you tend to have various problems that come out in terms of those steps. So look for cohesion. Uh, fourth point, um, ideally, a strategy should build local and national in parallel. When I say that Libya needs to have a much strong emphasis on the local, I do not mean we ignore the national. I mean we have a much thinner approach to the national. So it builds on what works locally, and it does not try to have national first and local just be an adjunct to that. So, but it doesn't mean we ignore. If you look at European history, there's two ways to build states. There was the way of conquering states, think France, think the UK, think Spain. And then there was the horizontal approach, think Switzerland, think the Netherlands. Um, those would be the two best examples. Holy Roman Empire, if you want to go way back with a really unusual history and um, mix of, of distribution of powers and so on and so forth. But I always think Switzerland and the Netherlands can teach us a lot 
about um, what states could look like in some of these contexts, but you need to have local and national. Um, uh, fourth, uh, fifth point is efforts to build local institutions need to have things built in to deal with the disadvantages. Maybe there needs to be an emphasis on accountability mechanisms. Maybe there needs to be some way to address, for example, migration issues. I'm aware that we have three working groups after the session. So uh, when we look at context, my first conclusion, definitely need a lot of assessments. When we look at how to deal with disadvantages, we need to look at issues about migration because and forced displacement because uh, if that uh, leads to greater fragmentation locally, it may lead to greater problems locally. And of course, cohesion I've mentioned many, many times. Um, six point, there's many more entry points than the central government. In some cases, I would argue the entry point that is more likely to succeed in the short term should be local governments um, and not put all your eggs in the central government basket, if you understand what I mean by that. Don't focus on the center. You might have to focus on the local and do maybe multiple local and use that momentum to build stronger national. That's really the case in probably Libya, Yemen, Somali, and highly fragmented countries, the DRC, I can imagine. I think you're more likely to, to find formulas like that that would work. And my last point is, your effort has to be sustained over a long time horizon, but short, medium, long-term goals are often different, and sometimes they are in contradiction. Um, I could go into much more detail. We don't have time for that. Uh, but do remember that the long-term goals must not be forgotten and must be sustained. And sometimes short-term goals, uh, if you divide a country on identity lines, that can be useful in the short term, but also can freeze things into place and make things harder longer term. Think Lebanon. So um, um, uh, you need to think about how to balance those two. And for my last section, because now I think I'm running out of time, role of non-state actors. So i got a few points here I just want to leave you with. Um, in some cases, more capable than state actors, and they may be the best entry point, as I've said. The goal should be always to find inexpensive ways to catalyze local efforts, but we should not have blueprints. I was just speaking to someone from USAID a few weeks ago with a bit of a puzzlement how do they approach this horizontal strategy in places like Le uh, Yemen, Libya, and these Middle Eastern cases? And I was explaining, you got to find what works, build on it, catalyze efforts, but do not have a, necessarily a blueprint, the end game. You have to look for incremental progress and not have an end game all the time. And therefore, a related point is, is that the relationships between these different actors, between the state and actors, is often fluid, and if you have a fixed agenda and a fixed endpoint, you don't adapt to change. You don't. You don't have scope for learning. Very important is feedback loops for learning. Incremental progress is key. When we have, when we look with some of these untraditional actors, um, or like non-state actors, but even local governments uh, that we may not have as much influence over as national actors, try to think that we. Don't want to define what they look like, but we and we don't want to have maximum standards. They will not become like us in the near future, but we need minimum standards about performance, about inclusiveness, justice, delivery of goods. These minimum standards may not be liberal, modern, but they surely need some standards uh, for is some issues of human rights. But I would encourage people not to aim for maximum, surely aim for minimum and then gradually, incrementally uh, increase standards. But don't try to get people to look like us. In some cases, the less stable cases, you might need to bring in diplomacy, defense, development, what we call the three Ds together, uh, because e economic opportunity, security, conflict management, governance, these are not separate issues. They're interrelated issues, and we need to think of them that way. I mentioned hybrid institutions. Sometimes you need to manage or integrate formal, informal. And the last point is we need to invest in the way we operate so we are able to work better in fragile contexts. Fragile contexts, greater risk, 
greater challenges to the context, greater need to develop inter iterative processes so we learn. So we need to invest in mechanisms that help us assess situations continuously and learn from the environment, get feedback from what we're doing, and, uh, and learning about local knowledge on a continuous basis and finding ways to have this feedback into the decisions we make in policy and try to create a virtuous cycle and not think of a fixed agenda going forward. Think of a virtuous cycle where we're learning and developing. So I thank you very much. I'm sorry I could not make it in person or do this live. I have to go on a mission this week. So, uh, but feel free to find out who I am, Seth Kaplan, and feel free, anyone that's got specific questions that I can help you with, do not hesitate, and coffee is on me next time you're in Washington. Please be well, everyone. Thank you so much.